This is the Nuck Deck. It's an open source PC gaming handheld that I've spent hundreds of hours designing and building over the last six months of my life and more money than I care to admit, just so I can share it with the world. All of that work comes down to this, so let's jump straight into it and see if we can wrap things up. Today I'm going to be completing the final batch of controller PCBs and putting everything back together again. There are four custom PCBs in the Nuck Deck, two per side of the controller. The right hand side of the controller houses the Raspberry Pi Pico, the controller interface display and the MPU 6050 gyro module. The left side is just the other half of the controller on the bottom PCB and the top PCB is where all the power management happens. The two sides of the controller are connected by a ribbon cable and communicate via I2C to keep the side to side connections to a minimum. You'll get to see how all of that works later when I assemble everything, but for now, let's start assembling the PCBs. PCBWay kindly supplied all the PCBs for this project, but more about them later. I'm starting with the right top controller PCB as it's the simplest. This one just houses the Raspberry Pi Pico, the gyro module, and the Hall Effect sensor for the right trigger. These controller PCBs should be pretty much identical to the final version I'll release, with the exception of where the Hall Effect sensor mounts, but I'll get to that in a minute. Before I do any soldering, I'm going to carefully run an M2 tap through these two holes for mounting the joystick. It's much easier to do this now before the Pico is soldered on top. Next, I'm going to place all of the capacitors. These are a 0.1 UF capacitor and I've placed them on each end of the analog signals to reject as much interference as possible, as the analog lines are quite susceptible to picking up noise. There are three right up close to the Pico, one for each of the analog signals for this PCB. There's another one up near the Hall Effect sensor and finally two on the back side of the PCB right behind the FFC connector for the joystick. Once those are in place, I'll move on to the FFC connectors. I like to cover the pads for the FFC with flux and then solder a couple of pins at one end of the FFC connector first and check the alignment. Only having a few pins soldered makes adjusting it easy if the alignment isn't spot on the first time. Once I'm happy with the position of the connector, I drag my soldering iron across the tops of all the connections and allow the solder to spread to all of them. The flux helps separate the pins but if you've got a little bit too much solder on there still, you can use a bit of desolder braid to suck up any excess between the pins. The next step is to solder on the Hall Effect sensor. I have changed the orientation of this sensor between this revision and the final revision that I'll publish, so your board will simply have a little surface mount Hall Effect sensor on it. It's not worth replacing these boards for such a minor change, so I'm just keeping a bit of extra length on the legs of my Hall sensors and bending them into the orientation that I need. Now we need to solder on the Pico. The first step is to connect two wires to the pads shown here. They are the data lines for the USB and we need to wire them to the controller PCB to pass the USB through to the NUC. Now let's solder up the Pico. It's important to use pin headers to space the Pico up away from the PCB as it will need clearance below it to allow the screws for the joysticks to tighten up without touching the bottom of the Pico. You can place the headers up whichever way you want but you can't have the pins sticking too far out the top of the Pico as they'll hit the inside of the grip sections of the case. I just took a Dremel to mine to trim them down, but you can also just use snips if you'd prefer. The gyro module is soldered on the same way as the Pico, but the length of the headers isn't an issue for it, so no need to trim them down. With all of that complete, it's time to give this PCB a soak in the cleaning solution, and we'll move on to the next one. Next up is the right front controller PCB. I'm going to follow the same basic process that I did with the previous one. Small surface mount components first, then ribbon connectors, and then the larger items at the end. The hardest part to solder on this board is the HUSB 238IC, as it has an exposed pad underneath, so you really need to use a hot air station for this one. All of the passive components around it are to configure the correct voltage and current from the USB-C port, so make sure you get the exact right values for these components. Everything else on this board is just hardware for the LEDs and connectors for ribbon cables and the LCD display. I find the switches don't appreciate being covered in the PCB cleaning solution, so I'll give this board a soak now to remove the flux before I solder them on. This is the cleaning solution I use. Some people just spray their PCBs down with isopropyl alcohol, but I find it doesn't completely remove this flux that I'm using, so I like to give it a soak and scrub with this stuff instead. I'm doing this in my laundry sink as it's a nice stainless steel surface in case I spill any, but please don't dispose of this stuff down the drain. Wipe it up with a paper towel and throw it away in your trash. The MSDS for this cleaner states you should wear gloves and eye protection when you're using it, so make sure you do that too. 
After the PCB has had a soak in the solution, I use an old toothbrush to loosen up any flux that hasn't come off yet. Focus around the FFC connectors as you want to make sure there isn't any flux stuck in them, but be careful of the little locking tabs as they can be fragile. Once you're satisfied the board is clean, you can rinse off any remaining solution. This is ideally done with demineralized water, but regular tap water can be used too so long as the board is dried thoroughly and quickly to prevent mineral deposits from forming on the surface. I find a quick blow dry with compressed air works wonders for this. Once the PCB is clean, we can go ahead and finish soldering on the buttons. I like to tin one pad for each of the buttons and then carefully hold the button in the correct place and reheat the pad to spread the solder onto the button. Once you've ensured the position is correct, you can solder the three remaining connections. Two pads on every button will require more heat to solder than the other two, as they are connected to the ground plane which has a lot more mass than the little traces for the other side of the buttons, so spend a little longer on those pads as necessary. The left front controller PCB is exactly the same process. Small surface mount components, followed by ribbon connectors, a clean, and then finally buttons. The main difference on this PCB is that it houses an Atmega 328P microcontroller to handle the I2C communications with the right half of the controller. Obviously the orientation of this IC is critical so ensure you check the orientation mark on the IC matches the PCB before soldering it in place. Now for the power management board. This one is a four layer board and it uses some advanced manufacturing techniques such as buried holes and epoxy via plugs. I won't pretend that I understand either of those processes, but the engineers at PCBWay helped explain to me what was needed to ensure that the design works as required. I'm going to do my best to reduce these advanced features wherever possible to keep the cost of PCBs as low as possible for you guys, but it's great to know that PCBWay has the capability to do these things when needed, and their engineers went above and beyond to make sure my design would work correctly. I didn't film the assembly of the power management board as there was a reasonable possibility I would need to revise it and I was definitely not wrong. This board uses a battery charger IC made by Texas Instruments in combination with another Atmega 328P to charge, monitor and balance our 4 cell pack. I did have an I2C current monitor on this board but I later realised that the charge controller has built in current monitoring and it was unnecessary so I've left it off for the final design. I pulled my hair out for weeks trying to get this PCB working. It is the sole reason this next video is so late. I eventually worked out that my problem was simply a missing connection in the PCB design and it could easily be rectified with a bit of wire. Huge shout out to Jeff from the Texas Instruments forums. He'll probably never see this but he put up with my stupid questions for weeks as I worked through troubleshooting this and helped point me in the right direction so I owe him a big thank you. There's a lot of other problems though with this initial design, including the lack of an I2C connection to the charger IC, meaning I am unable to get the battery monitoring set up or configure any of the charger settings with this revision. But none of that should stop me from being able to run from the battery and charge it back up, even if the charging is a bit slow, so let's assemble everything and give it a test. I've had a few comments on previous videos asking to see how everything goes together, so I'm going to assemble it with you guys this time. The first step is to place all of the buttons in their correct locations and ensure they are facing the right direction. Pay close attention to the ABXY buttons as they aren't all the same height so they will feel strange if they aren't in the correct spots. My joystick surrounds are already installed but if yours aren't, now's the time to add them and make sure they are held securely in place. A dot of some sort of glue is a good idea because if they fall out of position once everything is assembled, you will have to partially disassemble the controller to fix it. Next up are the speakers. I still haven't got around to designing chambers for these, so currently they just sit in their respective spots. A bit of foam tape on the back of these helps to prevent them from rattling around. Now we can lower in the front controller PCBs, ensuring that the silicon membranes are in place over the switches and attach them using the M2 standoffs. Now is a good time to connect the speakers and info screen, so I'll do that now. The info screen needs to go in before the PCB can go down too, so I'll put that in now and hold it in with a few dots of hot glue. The ribbon cable side needs to face down and I have a small bit of self-adhesive foam on the back of it to help keep it in place. The info screen is extremely fiddly, but I haven't worked out a better solution yet, so I just fight it with my tweezers until I can get the ribbon cable into the connector and lock it in place. The screen is powered by another connector on the back of this PCB, so I'll plug it in while we're here. I'll connect the ribbon cable that joins the two controllers now, 
along with the ribbon cables for the rear controller boards. Along the lower edge of the top section of the right controller PCB is a set of connections for the USB ports and power button that goes to the NUC. I've already connected wires to these pins, but I'll have a schematic showing the wiring and cable links for these wires in the documentation. I also needed to solder in place two wires from the front right PCB to the rear left PCB to provide power from the USB-C port to the power management system. I've also pre-soldered some wires with an XT30 connector to the outgoing side of the power management board. These will be connected to the NUC once it's installed. All of these power wires should be soldered in place before the battery is connected. Now the speaker output wires from the display driver need to be soldered to the left controller PCB. I'd love to have included a connector for this to allow for easy disassembly, but there's not a lot of room left in here so I've opted for direct soldering. There's contacts here for the headphone jack too. I haven't had a chance to remove the headphone jack from the display driver yet so I'll leave these for now, but they will be connected in the same manner as the speaker wires. After filming this, I had to remove these wires and replace them with smaller gauge wires so there was still room for the batteries. Next, let's install the joysticks on the rear controller boards. Slip the ribbon cable into the FFC connector and then use some short M2 screws to bolt the joystick to the PCB. The joysticks come with a 1.6mm hole in them, but I didn't want to have to source such tiny screws, so I carefully drilled out the mounting holes to 2mm. Make sure the joystick caps are installed before you bolt the PCBs down. The design uses Xbox One joystick caps as they are available cheaply and in plenty of colours. Once the joysticks are screwed in place, we can connect the ribbon cables from the front PCB and then screw the PCBs down with more M2 screws. Now that's all done, I'm going to fit the batteries. Each side of the controller gets a stack of two 3000 milliamp cells and all four of these cells are connected in series. The two halves of the pack are joined by a couple of bits of silicon wire that run across the bottom of the device below the NUC. The battery is then connected to the 5-bin connector on the bottom of the power management PCB and the battery is held in place with thin double-sided tape. At the moment, the battery wires are routed between the two left controller PCBs, but I'm going to leave a cutout for the cables in the next revision so you shouldn't have to do this. The last step is to connect up the NUC. This NUC has already been modified to have a 19-pin FFC connector in place of its HDMI connector, and I've also replaced the power jack with a bit of silicon wire and a connector. If you want to see how I replaced the HDMI connector, make sure you go back and check out episode 2. The NUC is bolted into the back cover so I can just connect up the plugs and ribbon wires in the appropriate places, flip it over and bolt it in from behind. The controller grip sections mount the shoulder and trigger buttons so they just need to be screwed on and then the final outlet cover plate can be screwed on the top to finish things off. Now, let's hit the power button and see if she starts up. Success! While it's up and running, I have a bunch of games I need to test. Ghosty from the Discord was kind enough to send over a bunch of indie Steam games that he thinks will run well on the NUC deck, so we better give them a go. I'm going to have to run through these pretty quickly because the video is already getting pretty long and there's a lot of games here. For reference, the NUC I'm using is a 7th gen Intel i5 with 16GB of RAM. Starting off with Ori and the Blind Forest. This one runs at 60fps with or without VSync enabled. Roughly 60% GPU usage and only 15% CPU at 1280 by 720 Obviously, it's not fully utilising the GPU, so I'm not sure why it won't go over 60 FPS. It plays very smoothly though, this one is a wonderful experience on this device. Moving on to Terra of Hemosaurus. This one also seems to be capped at 60 FPS regardless of having VSync on or off. Roughly 50% GPU usage and 10% CPU usage at 1366 by 768 this one gives me arcade game vibes and I love the look of it. Moving on, we have Cult of the Lamb. With VSync off, I can get up to 70 to 90 FPS, but with VSync on, it's only using about 65% GPU and 30% CPU. Grime was only getting about 45 FPS and had the GPU pegged at 100% and 60% CPU usage. It's almost playable, but it would probably kill the battery in about an hour, so probably not the best choice for this platform. Doomblade also wasn't great at 25 FPS, 100% GPU usage and 70% CPU. I'm surprised at how inefficient this one is as it doesn't look like a difficult game to run. Perhaps it's just a compatibility issue with this older hardware. Moving on to Have a Nice Death. At 1024 by 600 and with VSync on, this one cruises along at 60% GPU and 25% CPU for a buttery smooth 60 FPS. This one feels very intuitive to me, so I'll definitely be putting some more hours into it. 
Curse of the Dead Gods gets a steady 60 FPS most of the time, but at the expense of a near 100% GPU load, but only at 30% CPU load. I'm a bit of a fan of this isometric dungeon crawler genre, thanks to playing Diablo a lot as a kid, so this one may get some attention too, although I worry how the battery life will go with GPU usage like that. And finally, here's Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. This one gets a smooth 60 FPS with just 60% GPU and 30% CPU usage and looks terrific too. You can tell this one is very well optimised, which makes sense as it's the only non-indie game in today's lineup. Thanks for all the games, Ghosty. If you want to help support the channel too, I have a buy me a coffee set up so you can still help support the channel without getting sucked into a subscription service. This will help me continue producing high quality projects that I can share for free. I'm pretty happy with this revision of the controller PCBs so I will work on uploading the files for those in the coming weeks and I'll get the next revision of the power management system underway so I can hopefully wrap this thing up. Thanks for all the support so far, don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.